Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. The markets and gold enter the trading day in record territory. It's after the Fed signaled it remains on track for three interest rate cuts this year. The recent pickup in inflation did not sway Fed Chair Jay Powell's message that it is likely appropriate to lower rates. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. And that, if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. The economic outlook is uncertain, however, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. Chairman Powell also said it would be appropriate to slow the pace at which the Fed reduces its bond holdings fairly soon. Well, Nathan, reaction is still pouring into the Fed maintaining its rate cut outlook. We caught up with former New York Fed president and current Bloomberg opinion columnist Bill Dudley. We still think monetary policy is tight. We still think we're going to get more confident about getting inflation down to 2%. And so we still think we're going to cut rates this year. Timing is uncertain. And he, you know, he said over and over again, it depends on the data. And former New York Fed President Bill Dudley added that he thinks the Fed is still committed to getting inflation down to 2%. So, Karen, while the Fed held steady yesterday, there's been a surprise from the Swiss National Bank. It unexpectedly cut rates a quarter point to 1.5%. The franc tumbled after the decision, falling more than 1% against the dollar. Later this morning, the Bank of England is likely to keep its interest rates at a 16-year high. Well, staying in Europe, Nathan, job cuts coming to Barclays. Uh, Bloomberg News has learned the U.K. lender is preparing to cut several hundred jobs within its investment bank division. The move comes as the firm embarks on a years-long effort to trim costs and boost profits within the unit. And we're looking at a pair of initial public offerings this morning, Karen. It was quite the Wall Street debut for Astera Labs. The semiconductor connectivity company soared more than 70% on its first day of trading, giving Astera a market value of almost $9.5 billion. And today, Nathan, another highly anticipated IPO hits the market. We get the details from Bloomberg's John Tucker. John. And Karen. Reddit begins trading after pricing its IPO at $34 a share. That's the top of the expected range. The offering values the company at almost $6.5 billion. The website that hosts millions of online forums is 19 years old and has a fiercely loyal customer base. While its core business is online advertising, the real attraction is the ability to train in artificial intelligence models. Bloomberg intelligence analysts expect big providers like OpenAI, Google, Apple, Amazon, and Meta to pay for Reddit's data. Well, they expect it to eventually fetch a multiple closer to $10 billion. The ticker symbol again, RDDT. John Tucker, Bloomberg Radio. Well, looking at some other company news, Karen, the Justice Department is planning to file a lawsuit against Apple, perhaps as soon as today. More from Bloomberg's Doug Krisner. We're told Apple will be accused of violating antitrust laws by blocking rivals from accessing hardware and software features on the iPhone. The case will mark the third time the DOJ sued Apple for antitrust violations in the past 14 years. But this case is the first to accuse the company of illegally maintaining its dominant position. Apple is also under increased scrutiny in Europe over alleged anti-competitive behavior. Earlier this month, the company was hit with a $2 billion fine for shutting out music streaming rivals from offering cheaper deals. In New York, I'm Doug Krisner, Bloomberg Radio. Okay, Doug, thanks. Looking at shares of Apple in the pre-market, they are down 1%. Well, on the flip side, Nathan shares a Micron technology surging up more than 16%. The company delivering a strong revenue forecast for the current quarter. We get the story from Bloomberg's Charlie Pellet. Micron is the largest American maker of computer memory chips, and it was boosted by demand for artificial intelligence hardware. Micron Technology said fiscal third quarter revenue will be in the range of $6.4 to $6.8 billion. That compares with an average analyst estimate of $5.99 billion. Micron and its rivals are emerging from one of the worst slumps the memory chip industry has suffered, triggered by weak demand for PCs and smartphones. In New York, Charlie Pellet, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Charlie, thank you. Turning to politics now, the text is out on the deal to keep most government agencies open through the end of September. We get the details from Bloomberg's Steve Podisk in Washington. 
The $1.2 trillion package is backed by President Biden and leaders of both parties and comes before a Saturday deadline for a partial government shutdown. It expands detention facilities for migrants, imposes a 6% funding cut on the State Department and foreign aid, and bans U.S. embassies from flying LGBTQ pride flags or other non-U.S. official flags. The spending bill funds roughly three-quarters of U.S. agency budgets, including the Departments of Defense and Homeland Security for the remainder of the federal fiscal year. Congress approved funding for the other agencies earlier this month. In Washington, Steve Podisk, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Steve, thanks. Well, we turn to geopolitics now, and the U.S. is now pushing for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza tied to the release of hostages held by Hamas. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. is circulating a draft resolution at the U.N. Security Council calling for a ceasefire. He made the announcement in Saudi Arabia, where State Department Department spokesman Vadent Patel says he urged Israel to exercise caution. There should be no full-scale uh, military operation in Rafah without a credible and executable plan to protect the civilian upper, uh, civilian population. And Vadent Patel is at the State Department. Till now, the U.S. has used its veto power at the U.N. to block calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. And Karen, another top Biden administration official is on a surprise trip to Ukraine. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is in Kiev, where he promised the House will approve $60 billion installed aid. Here's White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby. He stressed the urgent need for the U.S. House of Representatives to pass the National Security Supplemental to meet Ukraine's critical battlefield and humanitarian needs. White House spokesman John Kirby spoke aboard Air Force One. Meanwhile, Kiev woke up this morning to its first large-scale attack from Russia in more than a month. Ukraine says it shot down 31 missiles that Russia fired on the capital today. 13 people were hurt. And we turn now to some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. And for that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Michael Barr. Michael, good morning. Good morning, Karen. In Haiti, armed gangs are launching deadly new attacks in the suburbs of Port-au-Prince. People under fire are pleading for help from Haiti's National Police Force. Meanwhile, a Florida state chartered plane from Haiti arrived yesterday at Orlando's Sanford International Airport after evacuating about 14 individuals trapped in the country amid the ongoing humanitarian humanitarian crisis. This man's son was rescued. It was very stressful. I can happily say it was a mission accomplished and we're finally reunited with Julian, um, our two-year-old son. The days were turning into weeks, the weeks were turning into months. Florida Executive Director of Emergency Management, Kevin Guthrie. You obviously saw tears, you saw laughter, you saw joy. I'll tell you, there's nothing more gratifying as an EM Director than to see that. Emergency Management Director Kevin Guthrie says hundreds of Floridians are seeking evacuation from the country. A charter bus company that transports migrants from Texas to the New York area has agreed to stop doing that for now. It comes as a lawsuit is pending against Roadrunner Charters. The New York City Department of Social Services filed a lawsuit against Roadrunner and more than a dozen other bus companies. According to the suit, the charter bus companies are implementing Texas Governor Abbott's bad faith plan to bring migrants to New York and should be held liable for the city's costs of care. Former President Donald Trump is running out of time to at least post a bond to appeal his New York civil fraud judgment by Monday. Trump could be forced to surrender some of his properties to help pay the $454 million. Trump's lawyers have claimed that more than 30 insurance companies rejected his bond bids, but New York Attorney General Letitia James dismissed their argument that he can't find the money, saying there is nothing unusual about even billions billion-dollar judgments being fully bonded. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, uh, then we will seek, uh, you know, judgment enforcement mechanisms in court, and we will ask the judge to seize his assets. It's part of last month's ruling accusing Trump and others of deceiving banks and insurers by inflating his wealth. An October 8th trial date is set in the case of a Marine veteran charged with manslaughter in the chokehold death of a subway rider in New York City. Witnesses say Daniel Penny, who was 25, was restraining Jordan Neely after Neely was acting erratically on the train. President Joe Biden says he is forgiving nearly $6 billion in federal student debt for almost 78 8,000 Americans working in public service. Biden says those helped include teachers, nurses, and firefighters.
Reuters. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg, Karen. All right, Michael Barr, thank you. It's time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update, brought to you by Tri-State Audi, and we bring in John Stashauer. John, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Get out your brackets. NCAA tournament begins in earnest today. Games in Pittsburgh, Charlotte, Omaha, and Salt Lake City. The Wagner Seahawks, who got their first ever NCAA win the other night, will try to be the third ever 16 seed to beat a one. They take on North Carolina. St. Peter's shocked the world two years ago with a Cinderella run to the Elite Eight. The Peacocks are back as a 15 seed. They'll take on Tennessee in Dayton, Colorado. Colorado took out Boise State. Grambling had never before played an NCAA game. Now moving on with an overtime win over Montana State. Celtics were up by 21, held on, beat the Bucks in Boston, 122-119. to 119. Milwaukee was without the injured Giannis under the Kempo. These are the top two teams in the East, but the Celtics are 11 games ahead. Warriors beat Memphis. Knicks go for a 4-0 road trip tonight in Denver. The Rangers visit Boston. The Capitals lost at Toronto 7-3. In Tampa, not a bad night for the Yankees. John Carlos Stanton, who comes off such a down season. Two-run homer in the first inning. Grand slam in the second. Another two-run shot in the fourth. The Yankees beat the Pirates 12-0. Aaron Judge was back in the lineup first time in 10 days. The Dodgers and Padres are back this morning in Seoul. L.A. won the season opener 5-2. Shohei Otani had a couple of hits in his Dodger debut. His new teammate is Mookie Betts. You know, really just seeing him get work, seeing him just do simple things. Well, what I think it's simple, just better than everybody else. Yeah, that's uh, It's really neat. It's really neat to see, but I, I'm really looking forward to seeing all the things that he's going to accomplish. Um, but I haven't really got to, to really... Uh, dive in and see some eye-opening stuff, but I know it's coming really soon. And Otani's in the news because his longtime interpreter, who he had a very close relationship with, has been fired. He's been accused of stealing millions from Otani to pay for gambling debts. John Stashauer, Bloomberg Sports. Now let's get more on the Fed decision, the latest pause from Chairman Powell and company. Jennifer Lee is uh, with us now, the senior economist at BMO Capital Markets. Boy, Jen, sure sounds like the Fed's bias is toward rate cuts. What did you make of the messaging from from uh, Chairman Powell and company. Oh, well, good morning, and thanks for having me on. You know, my first thought was, okay, so you guys raised GDP, you lowered un- unemployment, and you raised your core PC um, um, deflator forecast, and yet you're still looking for, you know, only three rate cuts, which I thought was quite interesting, and I was a bit confused. You know, but it sounds like almost like a Goldilocks situation. You know, the soft landing narrative is certainly playing out in, in, the, in their mind. But what was interesting is that I also thought he, that because the fact that he was very cautious still and that he said that there were still very much two-sided risks to this whole thing. So it's still, you know, patience is definitely still the, uh, uh, the, 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 the narrative, I guess, of the day. I think I hear a little bit of skepticism in your tone of the uh, soft landing narrative. Am I right to hear that? You know, I, I, I hate to say this, but I mean, I would love to have that soft landing, but sometimes I wonder, what are, what are we missing? What could go wrong? And, and you know, I mean, so the problem is that if inflation does remain still sticky, you know, then there's a possibility that we could see, you know, fewer rate cuts than, than what's still priced in right now. I mean, it's still fairly early in, in the year. Um, um, so, we, you know, a lot, and a lot of things could, you know, potentially, I think, uh, go wrong. So we'll have to stay very cautious and, and nimble. Uh, is, is another keyword that we, we use these days and uh, and see how things play out. But right now, you know, I think uh, we're pretty comfortable with our first um, rate cut call of July. In July as opposed to June. Can you go a little bit more into uh, what you're seeing uh, that has you thinking that maybe inflation could be a little stickier than the Chairman Powell seemed to indicate when he sort of shrugged off the hot reads we've had over the last couple months? Um, I think we're going to just need like a, f- a few more, only because, you know, we've had two surprise um, inflation readings. One was like super hot in January, and then we, you know, everyone, including us, thought there would be some reversal in February, and we didn't see that in both the CPI and the PPI. So this is where, you know, this is where we're going to keep an, keep an eye on things, especially on the, on the wage front as well. Even though wages have been coming down, but, you know, the good news is, you know, that's, it's great for consumers, it's great for workers that they have an income that they have money coming in still to help support spending and whether or not they're going to spend it all, you know, that will remain to be seen. Um, you know, you don't have to spend it all. You can keep it all for a rainy day. But again, I think just keeping an eye on, on the overall, overall momentum of the consumer. You know, we obviously saw some slowing in retail sales growth over the last, over the, uh, the beginning of the year. So we'll see how that plays out. So this is what we're kind of keeping an eye on is, is particularly the, the consumer and the strength of the consumer. 
Does the dot plot support the tone that we heard from Chairman Powell? It seemed like more Fed voters were calling for just two cuts this year, and the median next year is only three. Yeah, so it's, that was kind of interesting. So it sounds, you know, sounds like some, some more, uh, a few more of the officials are are also questioning, you know, the, the number of. Of, of moves, but it can also swing the other way. And, and it's interesting because um, 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 Bill Dudley yesterday afterwards was also sort of downplaying the role of the dot plots, even though everyone always, you know, uh, watches it very carefully. But I find that Fed officials always sort of be very cautious where, with, of, of watching too much into the dots. But, you know, that's all we have to go by to see what um, what the officials are, the committee overall is thinking. But overall, you know, the, the median is still for three cuts. And, and, you know, I think that's still a, a fair assessment, you know, until until it's not. And I hate to sound wishy-washy, but that's, you know, we're all data dependent. We're all, you know, we're not um, going on a meeting by meeting basis. We're not calendar dependent, you know, as, as President Lagarde would say. Um, so again, just keep watching the data, keep watching wages and keep watching consumer spending. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.